Better late than never. Welcome back, everybody. I'm your host, Storm. And I saw Suicide Squad today, finally. Um, there's been a little bit of controversy surrounding the movie even before it came out. Uh, there was a lot of hype behind it. Uh, even before the movie came out, I think because of the hype, obviously. Obviously, huge hype um, is going to Im impact anything, a movie or a show or a game, um, significantly so. Like, No Man's Sky came out recently, and because of the hype behind it, fan reception for that game is very polarizing. Some are saying that's pretty good for what it is. We all knew it was going to be. It's going to be space exploration. It wasn't going to be, it wasn't going to be, like, high survival type stuff, like, um, like something with Destiny or any other sort of sci-fi game, or maybe, um, Dead Space. Probably was, Dead Space is more horror survival, but, you know, um... And there are those who are saying that the game is very boring or repetitive, and they expected more from it. And again, that's because of the huge hype behind it. You know, Death, No Man's Sky had a lot of hype behind it. People were looking forward to it because it's supposed to be an indie game with a kind of big budget um, scale to it. And again, fan reception of the game has been a little bit polarizing, mostly positive, but you know, it's it, it wavers here and there. And that's and that sort of hype is exactly what kind of drove Suicide Squad. People were really excited for it because of the fact that it's going to be the first true supervillain movie. Well, Sony Pictures kind of teased uh, Sinister Six with The Amazing Spider-Man 2, and that failed horribly. They say they still want to do a Sinister Six movie, but we'll see how that turns out. Uh, but for the most part, DC beat them to the punch, unfortunately. Fortunately or unfortunately, how you want to look at it. Um, so Suicide Squad, in case you were wondering, if you didn't know... Um, it's a covert team, a, a government-sanctioned covert team, um, consisting of exclusively supervillains or any other hardened criminals, really. Uh, well, supervillains, no hardened criminals, criminals at all. You probably want to see Firefly or something like that on, on the Suicide Squad, but basically what the team focuses on in the comics and in the movie is to get as as a, as elite a task force as they can um, full of supervillains and put them into harrowing um, situations where they have to fight for their survival in order to get time off their sentences in prison. And that's really what the movie um, goes for. It, it stays true to that, thankfully. Thankfully, it wasn't some sort of weird thing where they... And that's, that's something movie, movie makers would do, honestly. They, it, thankfully, it wasn't some weird thing where it was just supervillains who got together to fight some sort of common enemy, go to evil... And they just call themselves the Suicide Squad or something. It, that would that would have been very very bad. Thankfully, it stood true to what the um, what the what the source material was, for the most part anyway. Uh, I think some of the good parts. Of the, what I liked about the movie is the fact that it finally, for the first time ever, we got we got to see Harley Quinn on screen. First time she's ever been depicted in live action media, and this I think was a very good place for her to get her debut. Though I will say, honestly, I think the thing I didn't like the most about that movie was the fact that Harley's backstory was very, um, it was very abridged. And her relationship, her relationship with the Joker, I'm sorry, relationship with the Joker, wasn't very fleshed out. For those, for those of us who know Joker and Harley, their relationship is not very healthy. I mean, for anyone who knows that relationship, we all know that Joker does not care for, for Harley in the slightest. Uh, she is really just a, a toy to him, a, a fucking puppet that he just manipulates whenever he wants to. He, he strings Harley along because he knows that she'll do whatever he wants for her because she has this undying love and affection for him, this sort of misunderstood or misplaced um, affection for him, and it just does not work out very well. I was, I myself and a lot of other people who are big fans of Harley were just ecstatic when she finally just ditched the joke and got her own solo comic. And then later on, she got a um, a co-op comic with Power Girl. So I haven't read, I still haven't read that one either. I had to uh, catch up with the comics. Hopefully she didn't go back to Joker, but something tells me she did at some point. I don't know for sure. I don't know. But it was nice to, but it was nice to see that she finally loved the Joker and was going doing her own thing. <clears throat> and and again, uh, I don't mind this interpretation of Harley. I think it's fine. Uh, but I will say... I. It's it's fine. It's it's not the best that they could have done. Um, depicting Harley as a true mental case, the way she was in the movie. Like for instance, just kind of saying random things, or not saying random things, but well, for instance, when they were doing that briefing, when all the 
the villains are being brought together to, to be briefed on the mission, uh, that one mo- awkward moment of silence between all of them, and we're just kind of looking around, figuring, trying to figure out what to do next, and then Harley kind of just blurted out, oh, what was that? You want me to kill everyone and escape? Oh, no, sorry, that was, those are the voices in my head. And... Uh, for to me that that kind of that, that's really just trying to kind of push the whole she's psychotic angle and she is psychotic but not to that extent she's not she's not deranged enough to talk about voices i don't think so uh, that part of it i didn't care much for uh margaret robbie really played up the insane angle for her, for her though the thing about harley is that Oftentimes, she's been described as being even worse than the Joker, and for me, I think that's the I think where that comes from is, is the fact that Harley, to an extent, is sane. She knows exactly what she's doing, but she's doing it with like the Joker backing her, that mindset of the Joker just kind of backing her and, and pushing her, but not exactly pushing her to do those in, those insane, inhumane things, you know. Uh, like she'll kill people, she'll kill people like, like the Joker does. But for Harley, there's always some sort of agenda behind it. Joker kills people randomly if he thinks it's gonna be funny, or he'll hurt people if he thinks it's gonna be funny. And for Harley, from what I've seen anyway, I haven't read any last little comic that, that she's ever appeared in. You know, note uh, she has more sort of an agenda. Like for instance, in her solo comic that I have, uh, in her solo comic. She killed a very old doddering man on life support because of the maybe kind of chance she could have had a Cadillac car in the future, or the present, rather. Like, if on the off chance that she could have maybe had a Cadillac, she kills an old guy on a, on a hooked up to life support. That's kind of crazy, crazy shit that she does. I think Joker, on the other hand, probably would have just... Probably, probably wouldn't have cared much. Like, oh, I could have had a Cadillac one day? Well, you know what? I'm going to go get a Cadillac anyway, because I want one anyway. And he'll just go go to a Cadillac dealership, kill someone, kill everyone in the place, and take the car for himself. Hall, on the, other, on the other hand, again, just thought, maybe I could have gotten one? Oh, well, fuck this guy. And... I remember quickly she threw him out the window of the hospital. Holly's derangement is almost unfathomable and almost and it just incorrigible, really. And again, in the sense, she's worse than Joker in the sense that she knows what she's doing. She's fully aware of what she's doing and how morally wrong it could be. But she doesn't have that. She doesn't have the same insanity that the Joker does. So I, I guess in, in you know in that way, a lot of people see her as being worse than, than the Joker, especially since she'll do whatever she can to please him, and usually usually that extends to her just again just doing the most insane fucking thing, blowing people up, kidnapping. Matter of fact, that's why she did actually kidnap. She actually successfully captured Batman once and delivered him to the Joker. Uh, in Batman the Animated Series, mind you, uh, I was having a comics too. I don't know. She she successfully captured Batman and delivered him to the Joker. Something just unfathomable, honestly, that any supervillain could have done. Harley did it to please the Joker, and Joker slapped her. And told her, like, no, 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 we don't do it that way. We don't just capture him and, and, and just kill him. That's not the way I do things, Harley. You should know better than that. You've been with me all these years. You should know better than that. So he slapped her and then freed Batman. And they actually apologized to him for the whole misunderstanding. So, I mean, yeah, the, this interpretation of Harley was, I think, very spot on, honestly. But again, I do think the, the whole trying to make her seem like 100% pure insane when she isn't uh, was pushing it a little a little much um, also I don't care for the fact that well obviously this is from Holly's point of view you know but the movie very much romanticized her relationship with Joker and again as we all know that's not a very healthy relationship Joker doesn't care about her but, very, but again Joker will do whatever he can to manipulate her 
and to keep her under thumb if he can. I mean, if she gets hurt or if she goes missing, he's not going to give a fuck until, she's t until she turns up again. The movie, again, really drove home the point that they was put supposedly in love or the fact that Holly cared about him so much. And again, that's, that's just Joker twisting her mind around, which, again, they... They could have done better, honestly. They did a flashback briefly showing how Harley and Joker met, but I think the impact of that scene, at that moment in their lives, is really lost when you don't see the entire thing. It wasn't just one obsession that did it. It was multiple sessions. You see Joker talking to her more and more and more until eventually, you know, the roles get reversed. That Joker is slowly just er eroding her mind and twisting her into, think into his way of thinking. And the movie kind of lost that, I think. It, it just... Really what it did was just kind of show a doctor who fell for her patient. And then she started being crazy for him. And she did in the comics too. And, and Batman the Animated Series, she did. But again, it was a slow burn type of thing. And it really showed you just how controlling and manipulative the Joker can actually be. For someone who was so normal. He, has, he was actually able to twist her into his way of life. Uh, and then again, the movie did not get that... Get that point through now i don't think it, that's a very big deal considering that the, the movie isn't just about harley it's about everyone else too but if you're going to introduce her in a backstory someone as important and, and a big fan favorite like harley i think that's something kind of important you need to get through and again it's not that important if harley ever got a solo movie which i don't think she would honestly but they did some sort of joker solo movie and she was in it or something maybe they could try and go back to that and flesh that that scene out a bit uh but Again, here it's fine. We know what happened. We know they got together. She met the Joker. She fell in love with him. And their lives went the way they did. So that's fine. Um, and I gotta say, I... Speaking of this, I know this is this is an, an ensemble cast of characters, both actor and, and character. But I did not like the fact that, like, Will Smith's Deadshot got so many lines in the movie. I mean, he was bas he basically was kind of the the main he hero of the movie. He the villain protagonist of the movie, um, the main villain protagonist. Uh, I know Will Smith is a very triple A actor, and you know, for for me, whenever I think triple A actor, for some reason, I kind of always think of Will Smith. I don't know what it is. I always think of Will Smith when I think triple A actor, and I get that that's who he is. He he was really that. He's probably. For most people who are probably casual fans or probably didn't watch superhero movies a lot, they'll see Will Smith's name up there. They'll see they'll see him in the movie and they'll think, okay, well, you know what? I'll go watch that movie. I like Will Smith. I like what he's done in the past. I'll go see this movie. He's in it. It's a comic book movie, right? Like, okay, I'll see it. And Batman may be in it. He was in it. He was in it. Kind of cool, though. I, I was honestly wasn't sure that he was going to actually do anything in the movie. Or was it just going to be like a brief cameo? You don't even get to see the guy's face. Like, they got someone else to put the like a makeshift low-budget bat suit on and just kind of do a quick scene with it or something. But he was fully in the movie. And with Ben Affleck, too. Uh, but anyway, Deadshot's a cool villain. You know, the man that never misses. And I love the fact that they, they get his costume down exactly. You know, the kind of red-orange um, top he has on with the belts and everything on it. Yeah, he had the wrist-mounted guns, the, the double barrel guns. That they got that done perfectly, and they got this mask on, too, from straight out of the comic book. And, I, and unfortunately, we don't see that too often, at least. No, well, no. When it, when it comes to, like, super villains, we don't see that too often when them actually getting the costumes down pat. Uh, the heroes, obviously, you have to get them their, their costumes down. Yet Spider-Man has to have red and blue, unless he's wearing the black suit. Or his feature foundation outfit, which is... Basically, the inverse colors of his black suit. Uh, Batman has to be wearing all black with a cowl in the cave. Superman has to be wearing all blue with the large S on his chest and the cape. You know, obviously those costumes have to, get, have to be down. Exactly. But for supervillains and the X-Men, honestly, until Deadpool came around anyway. Oh, and Days of Future Past. Well, that kind of, mostly. Um... They always just give him some sort of generic, maybe black outfit or just street clothes and just say, go ahead, do it, make do with that. And maybe he could have had like one wrist mounted gun that he only used one time that didn't work. Like he shot it and missed and had to abandon it or something. But they got everything right in the movie for Deadpool. Uh, uh, Deadshot, sorry. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I love that about, well, the visual aspect of his character anyway. I remember when I first saw the trailer for the movie. Uh, that 
I remember seeing the one we've seen where we saw uh, Deadshot hugging his child. Uh, and I knew seeing that, again, the, the, when, when the trailer first came out, uh, you saw a very, a very brief scene, just you know, the montage of trailers as it goes. You see him hugging a small little girl. And I just that I immediately knew, like, you know what, that's that's his daughter, isn't it? They're gonna ah, don't don't do that. Don't don't make him the super villain who is fighting for something. Like he has, he has a family at home or something he's fighting for. Like he's doing he's doing bad things, yeah. He's a bad guy, yeah, but he, he also has that family that he loves. I don't wanna see that. I wanna see a pure villain, you know. I wanna see someone who just doesn't give a fuck and who's in it for himself. And unfortunately they they did that with with, uh, with Deadshot. You know, Deadshot cares more about his daughter than anything else in the world, and he's a lot of times he does those contract jobs in order to uh, pay for stuff for her. Yeah, you know, bad divorce with his wife. He has, I think, he has joint custody of his kids. He, he he was able to see his his daughter anyway. Daughter, I don't think he has multiple kids. Just just his daughter. And for, I think what made this even worse for me though is flashback. We see Deadshot walking with his daughter after going to the store and buying her stuff, and they get to talking about what he does on the side. His his um life as an assassin. Uh, and then out of nowhere, Batman comes and gets him because Amanda Waller uh, tipped him off about Deadshot's location. So they get into fight in the streets, and before Deadshot can land another hit on him. They, they, they fight briefly. Deadshot shoots him a, a few times. And before they can fight briefly, uh, before they can, uh, Deadshot can get another shot in on him, his daughter stands between him and Batman, not wanting him to go any further with the fight, not trying to, to kill Batman. I would think Deadshot would be the kind of person who maybe, like, move his daughter out of the way to get to Batman. You know, some sort of villain would, would try and do that. Again, he's, she's standing in between the gun and Batman. Not like, not like he's aiming right above her or something. He's She's right in the middle between the barrel and Batman. And she just wants to see her father fighting anymore. She just wants to see him trying to kill the Batman. And it's just... Yeah, obviously a daughter doesn't want to see her father doing something like that. Unless she's completely fucking crazy. But trying to insert that sort of... That semblance of humanity into, into Deadshot, I just think, just ruined his character for me. I mean, everyone else except well, El Diablo is probably the only one. Uh, 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 it's fine, I think. Yeah, I, I just think uh, cause it, it kind of defeats the, po the point of this kind of Suicide Squad. I think they're all in it for themselves. The point of them doing these missions is to get out for themselves. And yeah, granted, you know, seeing his daughter is something he's doing something for himself, obviously. But I, it. it Trying to add a touch of humanity to the movie for the for the villains, I just did not think that was very good for character progression. Speaking of El Diablo, uh, fire guy, tattoos everywhere. In a fit of rage, he um killed his his um wife and children, burned the entire house down, and ever since then he's just been um penitent, trying to make up for what he did in the past. And of course, of course, the movie. He relinquishes his penitence, penance, whatever, and decides to fight for the heroes, you know, the Suicide Squad. I mean, not heroes. Um, and you know what? I think his character was a bit better than Deadpool's. Damn it, Deadshot, because of the fact that with Deadshot, you know, we see his daughter. We see him trying struggling to make it back outside for his daughter. Again, adding that layer of humanity to him, which I don't think worked. El Diablo murdered his entire family and became pacifistic because of it. So for him, I think that one small, small touch of humanity was a little better than trying to humanize every, everyone, honestly. Well, let's say, that, 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 that's what I was getting to before. Because, again, it's, a, it's an ensemble cast, I get that. But again, like, like I said, Will Smith had like the most lines in the movie out of everyone, uh, everyone in the Suicide Squad anyway. And I know you, you can't get 
you can't flesh out every single character as much as you want to in an, in an ensemble cast of supervillains, especially. But still, I think he, I think he kind of talked too much. There's that one scene where they were in the bar talking with each other, and when El Diablo was explaining his past about how he accidentally killed everyone in his family and decided to just not have anything to do with his powers anymore, I think that moment was a little better for me because throughout throughout the movie we see El Diablo just not wanting to fight, not actively not doing anything in, in, in any of the battles, and then we then we find out exactly why he's not doing anything. He even, he even says he doesn't want to fight anymore when we first meet him. Um, and then when he explains why later on in the movie, that worked for me because we see him being so uh, passionless about what they're doing and being trying to avoid a fight as much as possible. Even being called out on it a couple of times and even saying, you know what? No, I'm not fighting. I told you guys before, I'm not fighting, so I'm not going to fight. Then shit gets real. He has to do something. He, he gets egged on by, once again, dead shot. You know, I would think maybe someone like I would think um, Killer Croc would be kind of the person who would try to egg him on, kind of, because it, it's it's all the lives on the line. If they, if they fuck up this mission, then they all die. And I don't know, Killer Croc is, is a is a gruff guy, you know. So I would think he, someone like him would be a little more intimidating and a little more interested in getting the shit done, so they can move forward. At least he would kind of, at least he'd be the first person to me, I would think would do something like they would become aggressive towards someone not pulling their weight like Deadshot did with with El Diablo until egged him on to actually using his powers to fight up um, the enemies which I'll get to in a moment which kind of eh something that bothered me about the movie but I think that's kind of the case with like like I don't think even comic movies but like possibly movies like this in general but I'll get to that in a minute uh Captain Boomerang uh, I mean, not that, I'm a, not that I'm a big fan of Captain Boomerang to begin with, but I don't. I kind of think that his whole um, kind of cheeky, sarcastic um, persona wasn't really necessary for the film. Not for his character, anyway. I mean, the comics, you know, Captain Boomerang is always serious. He knows what he's doing. But in the movie, he was just kind of lackadaisical, just just really, just really like unconcerned almost. Like he, the way, the way, just the way he came off. Like, well, I think I think Captain Boomerang in the movie they kind of exemplify what the Suicide Squad is about. He wants to get free. He's untrusting of anyone or anything that's going on. And so everything he can to get the fuck out. Uh, which explains once more, once more part in the movie um, when he actually convinced Slipknot. I have no idea who the hell Slipknot is, honestly. So fuck about it. I'm sorry if I can't say anything about him. Cause that's was actor though. He's only in, what, two or three scenes when he gets killed off. When he tries to escape, that's when everyone learns that those detonators in their necks that's forcing them on this mission are real. His whole, his whole head gets blown the fuck off as he's trying to escape and his, his body's just um, dangling by the, by the cable he launched up to the, to the, to the building to escape. Um, yeah, Boomerang just kind of felt like he, they were trying to make him into like the wild card character other than the Hulk, I suppose. And I don't think it worked for him, honestly. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think for someone like like Boomerang in this movie, anyway, they kind of made him more so like a conspiracy theorist kind of, kind of guy. Like he's he's serious about what's what's going on. He's not being really joking or anything, but he's like seriously conspiratorial about the whole thing. I think that could could have worked better for him than what they gave us. But I don't know. Uh, who else was was uh, actually I mentioned before Killer Croc. Um, a bit disappointed in him honestly. Killer Croc has always been a bit bigger than uh most of the villains, most of the creatures in general. Not super tall in the comics, but he's like what was he like seven eight feet tall maybe. You know just he he'll usually tower over everyone else. And as much as people hate CGI, too much CGI in the movie in a way. I think they probably could have CGI'd Killer Croc a little bit. Just make him taller. He is a, he is very tall. Again, not not super super tall. Like again, seven eight feet tall. He he is. Uh, but in the movie, he was just the, the same height as his actor, you know. And they just put him in, put him in makeup, make him look scaly. That was it. 
The way it looked in the movie, though, was fine, I think, because in the comics, Killer Croc actually has a skin condition that just went way the fuck out of control. It's an actual skin condition he, he has uh, in the comics, again. I think in the movies, they tried they made him a metahuman, which does make sense, I suppose, considering his reptilian features, but in, again, in the comics, it's a skin um, disease he has that makes him scaly and crocodile-like. Crocodile-like. Uh, which really alienate, alienated him as a kid and just kind of, like I always have, just jumped to a life of crime. He, he does what he does because of his of his past. Uh, he was fine, I think. Again, he was fine. But I think too few lines for him. He didn't talk all that, that much. He just kind of sat there. He, he stood there and just growled every now and then and occasionally said something while, well, again, Deadshot talked the entire time. I don't think it's Deadshot, I don't think it's Will Smith. I, Will Smith is fucking awesome, but it's just, again, it's an ensemble cast. Everyone wants, everyone wants to see all these characters and it's just him talking. And I just think that's just way too too much, too disproportionate. We could have gotten, we could have gotten to know everyone a, a lot more, especially, especially since they're doing a sequel to this. We'll see if they use the same characters. They probably use most of the same characters, but Again, this could have been done just to get a basis for all the characters in, in the movie now. So when the sequel does come, we know everyone a little better. Hopefully the sequel doesn't try to rush the character development for people who come back for the movie anyway. Uh, Katana. I'm not sure Katana, honestly. I remember initially when I saw the trailers for and that Katana in the movie, I was a little taken aback because in the comics she's a hero, but in the movie them well she's and in the trailer make it look like she was going to be a supervillain, but she was working with the government, I'm covering, what's his name Rick Flag the guy's name the guy's last name is Flag. Uh, flag flag flag. Yeah, Rick Flag. I was right. Rick Flag, the guy who's leading the uh, the operation in the movie. I think very obviously the one person who played the the role exactly exactly right was Viola Davis as Amanda Waller. Shh, fuck me, dude. I have not seen that great of an interpretation of Amanda Waller since the Justice League cartoon, way back when. Viola Davis played that role exceptionally well. Amanda Waller is just like the hardest hard ass in the entire DC fucking multiverse. And really, I can't blame her, honestly. I mean, if you think about it, this is the point in time when metahumans are coming out of the woodwork. We have Superman flying around the skies, patrolling the entire planet. We have, we have the Bat Vigilante, Making his own brand of justice in Gotham, and no one can stop him or even find or get, you find him or get a good look at him. We have an ancient M Amazonian from another island who comes to the U.S. seeking to bring peace, as was her original mission. You have the Flash, who can run faster than anyone in the entire wo in the entire world. You have the Green Lantern, who Hal Jordan is from Earth. But he constantly goes out to space, and they do often have other members of the Green Lantern Corps coming to Earth, from out of space, coming to Earth. Aquaman from underwater, who, who he rules an entire kingdom underwater, and he'll, he'll occasionally come up to the surface world. You have people like Cyborg, who, who is a cyborg. I don't know what to say about that. I really don't know what to say about that, Jesus. All I'm gonna say about him is he's a, he's a cyborg and he he used to be the Titans now he's with the, he's with the Justice League. Oh, fuck, I need a little more about him. Um, Hawkman and Hawkgirl, who from other who are aliens themselves. Uh, I like Hawkgirl a lot more than Hawkman, honestly, probably because of the, the Justice League cartoon. And Martian Manhunter, an actual fucking Martian from another planet who comes to he's, he's openly an alien coming to Earth and everything. So you know what? I don't exactly blame her for the way for the stand she's taken against metahumans and the way that this whole paradigm shift has, has, has occurred on Earth. I, they're, and this is what I love about the way DC does this too. They really frame the superheroes as living gods on Earth. 
that we, when when you read something like the Kingdom Come um, storyline in the comics, where the superheroes of Superman's time or of, of the days of old are spoken of in legend, or how something like maybe Injustice um, really shows what can happen if these people lost control. So, like if Superman, actually, Kingdom Come does the same thing too. Spoiler alert for that story if you haven't read it yet. Towards the end of the towards the end of the story, Superman does kind of lose his temper and oof, just glowing red eyes, unstoppable rage. Like he really he literally could have just killed everybody in that moment. And you couldn't blame him, honestly. But then again at the same time, you can't blame the government for what they did. You have metahumans unleashing Armageddon on the world, and no one can stop them. What the fuck are normal people supposed to do? Normal people can't fight them. So you have someone like Amanda Waller who's taking drastic measures to, to not even just keep up, just to keep themselves safe. So she takes these hard stances against supervillains who many of them can do the same things that superheroes can do, but don't have the same moral dilemma that they do. I mean, it just has to fuck with your head. I mean, what can you do to keep everyone in check to make sure everyone can survive to see the next day? So the way Amanda Waller operates, I can't really blame her. <sighs> I can't really blame her, but sometimes I'm not sure I can exactly like her. Mm, especially in the movie, when... In the movie... Mm, Okay, so the actual mission for the movie, uh, the Enchantress, another member of the Suicide Squad, or she's supposed to be a member of the Suicide Squad. And this is what I didn't like about the movie, honestly. Rather than having some sort of paramilitary organization that they send them to fight against, like maybe a new interpretation of Bane or something coming in, or maybe even even Ra's al Ghul being the, the main antagonist or something, the Enchantress um, double crosses everyone. She frees her brother. The enchantress, the enchantress is a witch, in case you're wondering, an ancient witch, according to the movie, over six thousand years old. She frees her brother to help restore her own power. Her heart was is, was captured by the military, and Amanda Wall has no possession. When uh, Amanda Wall can basically stab the heart, which she did in the movie when they found she double crossed them, stab the heart multiple times in order to kill her. Or even just squeeze it in order to cause an extreme pain. So the Enchantress again, intended for the Suicide Squad, double crossed everyone, freed her brother, and set in, and set in motion plans to destroy the entire world. And so the the crux of the, of the movie, the mission of the movie was basically to get to I think was it was it no Midtown is what it was. Get to Midtown from Bell Rev, Bell Rev Prison. And save a certain someone, the the mission priority. They weren't given an actual name, they were just given a code name for for the target. Who, as it turns out, was Amanda Waller herself. Shit was happening, she wanted to get the fuck out of there, so she sent them on a mission to come and save her. Not now, Alistair, go away. So she was sent on a mission they were sent on a mission to go save her. Uh is it I mean, it was a, it was a good plot twist, I think. It was a very good plot twist, I think. But I mean, I mean, the crux of the plot of the movie, the mission that they were all doing, that we all saw in the trailers and everything, was just to go and save her. I don't know. A good plot twist, I think. But I don't think that almost the entire plot of the movie should have should have been focused on that. Exactly. Uh, which was another point of the movie that I didn't like is the fact that, and again, a lot of movies are doing this, especially if it's a large scale movie with a bunch of bad, guy, bad guys you need to fight, a bunch of minions you need to fight. Well, there have to be minions. The, the Enchantress and her brother, Incubus, I think his name is, that's, that's, that's what it says on Wikipedia anyway, were indoctrinating regular humans and turning them into their soldiers. For for war and for battle, uh, just faceless minions that you fight off. The way we 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 got to see the Suicide Squad in action, 
you know, one particular scene where they were just taking out minions left and right, and good scene, I guess. It was a good way to show them off, but at the same time, like, I think it could have been much better, I think. Yes, that last part of the movie. It would be much better, I think, if they just had some sort of military organization they were going against. Like, if it was, again, bringing a new version of Bane or bring in Ra's al Ghul again. You know, because they have been known to do stuff like that. Have, have it be the League of Shadows or something. Who are doing some sort of operation in some foreign part of the world and just send them on that, send them to do that mission. I don't know, just the whole destruction of the world thing from an ancient witch with a bunch of faceless minions. It just We see that a lot. And, I don't know, I don't think Suicide Squad needed to do that, but it did. Uh, I think the, the last part of the movie just kind of bogged down with so many cliches. Like, El Diablo... Yeah. Oh no! It's okay. So at the end of the movie, they need to distract um, Incubus, the Enchantress's brother, so they, so they can set a bomb right under him and blow him the fuck up because he he's the problem. They need to get past him to get to to, to the Enchantress. So in the middle of it, um, the El Diablo sacrifices himself in order to make sure the bomb goes off without a hitch. He keeps Incubus uh, distracted long and. Not pinned down, but kind of hold on to him and keep distracting up so the bomb can go off and kill him, Incubus, and the soldier who set who set the bomb under underground, underneath them. And then we have the part of the movie where the Enchantress fights off. The, okay, the fight with the Enchantress against the entire Suicide Squad was fucking great. She took two swords and was just fighting everyone off left and right. Including Deadshot firing rounds at her, which which wasn't which, which weren't even hurting her. He's firing off rounds left and right, rounds left and right at her, not even hurting her, and she's taking those two swords that she has and just firing off everyone left and right, all the attacks. So at the end of the movie, so at the, at the, end, of the movie, end of the fight, she finally just has enough, just takes away the weapons from them, and offers, offers them an ultimatum, like every villain does: join her or die. In the new world order she's trying to create. Join her in the new world order or die. So Harley feigns interest. So she can, she, can, she can get close enough to the Enchantress. And uses... She grabs... She very discreetly... Discreetly. Is it discreet? No, it was. It was. Uh, Enchantress told her to bow before her. Which she does. Well, she gets low anyway. Grabs Katana's sword... And then uses it to cut open the Enchantress's chest to take back the heart that she stole from Amanda Waller to begin with. So she can get her full power back. Uh, grabs it. The Enchantress is completely drained of her power. And then Rick Flag, the guy leading the mission, kills her by squeezing the heart. What gets me about that scene, though, is when Harley did it, she had to say, she had to say like, the most clean... The most cliched, hackneyed thing ever. Right before she slashes the enchantress and gets the heart out, she just says, I would join you. I'm paraphrasing here just a bit. I would join you, except you attacked my friends, and then slashes her with with full force, causing the heart to just plop out. And then, I think it's... Oh, fuck, I, I, was playing, I, was playing, I was playing close attention. What was it? They took a bomb... And tossed it towards the energy field, or nexus, whatever it was that the, the Enchantress had, had conjured. And Deadshot f was going to fire off around at it. And the last second, for some weird, unnecessary reason, I don't get what the, what the point of this was. At the, the last second, before he, he sh made the shot, um, Deadshot had another vision of his, of his daughter in front of him. Which honestly was probably the Enchantress herself trying to mess with him. But really, regardless, I don't, there, there was no point in the scene. Whether it was him thinking, or whether it was the Enchantress messing with his head, trying to get him to not pull the trigger on, on the gun to shoot the bomb going off the, after the energy nexus, Deadshot saw a vision of his daughter begging him not to not to fire because you know bringing back that situation before with that running with Batman, 
don't do it, Dad. Don't fire. The only way we can be together is if you don't do this. And then, of course, Deadshot kind of powers through that and thinking, you know what? I'm doing this anyway. And fires. The bullet hits its mark as it should, as it always would with Deadshot. Sets off the bomb. Everything explodes. And Enchantress is completely drained of all the power altogether. And then, then she gets killed. Again, whether it was Deadshot himself thinking or the, is the Enchantress messing with his mind, which it probably was, honestly, still, that scene had no place in, 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 in that moment. Look, we've watched that. That moment had no place in that scene. It's... it's it, it, it just... The ending was just full of cliches for me. Oh, oh, and best part about it. I didn't mention this. I should mention this, honestly. I didn't mention it. The Enchantress inhabits the body of Rick Flagg's girlfriend. Uh, what was her name? Dr. June Moon. She, she was exploring a cave one day. Came across the Enchantress's idol that contained a soul in it. Opened it. The Enchantress came out and inhabits a body. So now it's a kind of two personas, one body sort of type of situation with them. And Amanda Wall sent her, the military back into that cave to find her heart. After, after researching the entire thing and figuring out whoever controls her, the Enchantress's heart can control her. So they went back and got the heart. And that's exactly how she got involved with the Suicide Squad. So basically, the entire point of Rick Flag's, Rick Flag's agenda was to save his girlfriend. They they become they had become involved since then. So when she when the Enchantress refused to to release his girlfriend, Doctor June, Rick Flag killed her by squeezing the heart and killing the Enchantress. But somehow, yeah. June came back to life. Well, it was never dead to begin with. So you destroy the heart, Enchantress is gone. So you think they'll, they'll take the body with her too, right? But instead, June actually comes back to life. She kind of rips off like the mud mask she had on for some, I think, which was the Enchantress's face. And everything's back to normal. They're all fine. I mean, I'm not against a happy ending, don't get me wrong, but I mean. It's just the climax of the film, I think, I thought was just full of nothing but just cliche after cliche. And I, I just think that kind of hurt the momentum that, that the film had up to that point. Best part of the ending, though, I guess at this point the climax is over. Whereas when Amanda Waller kind of emerged from, from imprisonment, and chances I captured her to try to figure out how to get her heart back and do something else, I forgot. Waller still had the detonator for the bombs in their necks. They were all... Everything was then done. They were all just going to go off to the, with their lives. Everything's done. They're free to go, sort of. I mean, like, no one's going to stop them. Rick Flagg was going to stop them. He was only the mission. But in order to convince them to help him further, when they when they went, decided to opt out of the entire mission, we found out that not only were they saving Amanda Waller the entire time, but they had to go and fight the Enchantress... And all those fucking superpowered minions, they opted out. They said, fuck it, we're not doing any more kills if you have to. We're not gonna kill us if you want to, but we're not gonna go to something that's actually that's going to actually factually kill us. So then they all had their heart taught in, in the ball I mentioned earlier, where they tried to humanize everyone, which I thought was just bullshit. I mean, dude, they're supervillains. There's no there's no humanization needed. So he destroyed his own detonator and convinced them to come with him. They they obliged, they did it, saved the entire world. If the world is destroyed, then what the, what the fuck is 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 the I mean, use for them? You know, no world means nothing. So fuck it, we're here. We're going We need to save the world. We we need, to, we need to save the world for ourselves. Otherwise, what was the point? So we'll do it. We'll do it. And they and they, they they save the world. The big What was I getting at? Yeah, again, I just think it was funny at the, at, at the end of the movie. They got off scot free, basically. No strings attached. They're all about to go about their lives. And then the man in the wall comes out of nowhere and says, I, I, I still got the detonator. Don't go anywhere. And I think one of the best lines in the movie, Will Smith just looks at her and just goes, How are you not dead? Probably, probably the funniest line in the movie. One of the funniest lines in the movie, honestly. And, you know, kind of the hard-ass um, 
Amanda Waller saying they'll get 10, 10 years after sentences. But Deadshot was able to convince her, like, no, 10 years plus I get to see my fucking daughter for for saving the world. And Amanda Waller's like, eh, okay, that can be arranged. We'll do that. He, he did save the world. Okay, I'll give you that. You did save the world. And so overall, I think the movie was fine. Joker. Hmm. This is the thing I didn't like. It's... I should talk about this earlier when I was talk about Holly, but Joker. Um, people, when people saw the first screenshot of Joker, there was just instant backlash because he looked like some sort of hip hop or heavy metal wannabe. A lot of people people were saying he had tattoos everywhere. He had a grill in his mouth. He had a great tattoo in his hand, though. The way he just—it's a, a laughing mouth. Teeth and tongue and everything on his hand. He just kind of puts it in front of his mouth like this. Sometimes. So he did it once in the movie anyway. I thought that was clever. But. Uh, it's, it's not. I don't think. For me, it's not even the, his appearance. I think once you kind of get to know the character, it, this interpretation of the Joker, I think you'll, you'll get. I think if you, once you get to know this interpretation, you can kind of justify the look. Now, whether you like the look or not, I think it is up to you. But I think after I got to know this interpretation, how he really is like this this, this hip hop gangster in the movie. Yeah, he has a club where he goes to clubs or something. He's got the jewelry on. The way he he, he acts in a very not high, kind of a high and mighty fashion with the with the people he he's around usually. But um, I think what I can't get around, get get behind rather, was the fact that he wasn't exactly crazy, so to speak. This Joker just seemed kind of violent. Violent and full of himself, but not exactly crazy. Not very calculated like the like um like Joker usually is. That crazy mix with the cal with a, a calculating mind. Jared Leto's Joker was And honestly, like they really could have just like the way this Joker was was made, they really could have, like replaced him with any sort of random character, and it kind of would have been fine. Yeah, yeah. I think I wasn't like either. Was like that his his face was kind of whiteish, like they 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 were like like it was really just just kind of makeup they put on him real quick. But I noticed that it's just the face. And most of his body is, is regular skin tone. Again, different interpretation of the Joker. Maybe it works for this interpretation. But... I don't know. Again, not crazy and calculating. Just kind of violent and full of himself. I don't think this Joker was all that great. His laugh was fine. The crazy Joker laugh was fine, I think. I find it very odd, though, that... I, I was saying before that how Joker and Harley's relationship isn't exactly healthy. Uh, I find it kind of odd that Joker, Joker's entire part in the movie was just him trying to find Harley and bring her back. Which, again, it's kind of odd to me because Joker doesn't really care about her. If she shows up again, that's awesome. If she doesn't, uh, well, what are you going to do? He doesn't really care that much. Or at all, even. But he, he went through such effort to get Harley back. I thought it was... Um, a bit odd, honestly. He cares about Harley to the extent that w of what she can do for him. I'm sure, she's a high rank, a high ranking minion of his. And is, and I guess technically they're in a relationship together, but he doesn't care about her to that extent. And again, I know, I know, different interpretation of the Joker. This Joker is different from the one you've seen before, but and I, 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 don't, I don't know. That part of it, I, I thought was just a bit odd. For the lengths he was going to to get to get Holly back, mm, I think the pacing for the movie was. When we talk about absolute, 
That's your oh, real quick, real quick before I go further, I was talking about the faceless minions. Um, the fight scene that the Suicide Squad had with um, the minions of uh, Enchantress. Very distinctly, they were they were going to avoid them. They came across them, a bunch of them just kind of standing there, and part of the scene was them kind of just kind of eyeing each other, briefly. And I very distinctly heard that we proven that they can't be killed or fought off normally. So you know what? Just avoid them. And that's what we're gonna do. Like Rick Flag told everyone, said, "You know what? Fuck this. We can't fight them apparently." Bullets don't hurt them, apparently, or, or something. Which we, we're being told on radio, don't fight them. So you know what? We're going to cut across the alley. We're going to go around them and go straight to, to that energy vortex. We heard that distinctly. Uh, they didn't move fast enough. They, they didn't go fast enough as they should have. And those minions kind of got antsy and started a fight. And that's what got to see that great fight scene with all of them going at it. Except Double Diablo, of course. Because, again, he doesn't want to fight. What gets me though is that we, we just heard them say well, you can't fight them normally, that they can't be harmed or something. So cut around, so go around them to, to get to where the Enchantress is, or to get where Waller is. I think, I think no, they're still going after Waller at this point, because uh, they didn't know that yet. We just simply heard you can't fight them, so they fight them anyway, and they win the fight. Harley's using a, a baseball bat, Dead, Deadshot's using regular bullets. Uh, Killer Croc is using his bare hands just to crush everyone. Boomerang is using his razor sharp boomerangs. Katana is using a sword, and Rick Flag is using, using his gun, shooting them all. You you just said they couldn't fight them, and then you fight them anyway. I don't see the logic behind that, really. And then when they find more minions throughout the film, throughout the rest of the film, they fight them and win. I just why I'm saying you can't fight them or kill them or anything. Uh, and then fight them. Unless I'm missing something. Did, 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 did I misunderstand what they said? Like, you can't fight them when in the middle of a mission, just cut around. No, I'm pretty sure I did. I'm pretty sure I know I heard them say we prove you can't fight them. Like, because early in the movie, early in the movie when Incubus was indoctrinating people. I'm pretty sure we saw like people taking shots at the, at the mint. No, what is the mint? Did, did we? I don't know. But they, they distinctly said we proved you can't fight them, so go around them. That was the plan, and they ended up fighting him anyway and winning the fight. So I just think that, that's kind of odd. Please, someone correct me on that. Have you seen the movie? You seen the movie enough times so you can remember what I'm talking about? Please correct me if, if I'm wrong. I just that's just like the the one weird spot them for the movie to me they, it, it's somewhat insignificant I know but still that's you saying you, you just said you can't fight them why are you fighting them I don't get that so anyway for as for the plot of the movie itself and the pacing is, is a bit weird um, beginning the movie obviously is setting up the characters and introducing everyone which it, it did very well honestly the way the movie introduces everyone was really was really reminiscent of James Gunn to me, how he, everyone had these fluorescent credentials being put put up on the screen next to their names and and the profiles, you know, uh, it's basically just like like the camera freezes for a second, and superimposed on on the screen like these neon fluorescent uh, again credentials for them, very odd things like hobbies, favorite foods, just which just weird shit, which really again seems like something James Gunn would do. And I was sitting, I was sitting watching the movie, I kept thinking, how, how did James Gunn not do this movie? This is something that he should have done. Don't tell me he has to do this movie. I'm on, I'm on Wikipedia right now. Directed by no David Ayer. She should he should have done the movie, or they they both should have done it together. Something I don't know. Uh, so they get in the movie just. It just establishes everyone's characters. And the next part of the movie is when they're on the mission, and then there's the climax. Mm -hmm. eh. it, it, it's a three act structure, I get that. But I don't know, it, it always kind of seemed mismatched to me. Like, you, you introduce these, this, this motley crew of like completely incompatible people. Then there's this suicide mission they're going on. 
and then all of a sudden it escalates to the fate of the entire world rather than the, the, just the fate of their own lives. I just think, I just felt things were a little uneven in the, and things escalated way too quickly. I felt that I had to go with a saving the world plot for a group of supervillains. Yeah. And again, like I said before, though, yeah, at, at that point, they kind of did have to save the world because if the world is destroyed, what's left for them? What, what, are they, what are they supposed to do? So obviously they had to save the world, but I just felt they didn't need a save the world plot for, for this particular movie. Mm. I mean, it was a fun movie. I liked it. I mentioned before, there, there's a lot of controversy surrounding the movie because early reviews for it, critics were giving it just mega shit. And Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 4.7 out of 10. 26% based on 260 reviews, an average rating of 4.7 out of 10. The site's critical census reads, Suicide Squad boasts a talented cast and a little more humor than previous DCEU effects, but they aren't enough to save the disappointing end result from a muddled plot, thinly written characters, and choppy directing. Which... Uh, they, they're not wrong, in all honesty. Uh, muddled plot, well, I mean, kind of, I mean, again, like, the first act of the movie is just to completely introduce the characters and try and get you into the mindset of what's going on, obviously, as the movie should. Second act is Red the Rescue Mission, what was that? and then third act completely escalates to Fate of the World for a movie about supervillains being forced to work for the government to save their own necks. Yeah, literally and figuratively. I just... Mm. Also, don't get, there, there's the subplot of the movie of Joker trying to bust out Holly from prison. I just thought that was needed. You know, I just... It's not exactly trying to cram too much into one movie like, like the Amazing Spider-Man 2 did. But at the same time, I think could have used a little better focus on maybe one or two things rather than trying to... trying, trying to do all that at, at, at once. The only written characters, well, yeah, kind of. Again, it's again, like I said, it's an it's an ensemble cast of, of villains and and actors. You can't get to everyone and get and get them enough screen time as as they deserve. Uh, but they they could they could have kind of you know let someone else besides Deadshot talk the entire time. Well, I'm at the as much as I love Holly, I'm a huge Holly Quinn fan. I fucking love Holly to death. I love her, love her, love her. Too much of her too, honestly. I noticed that with the first show for the film, like way too much Holly in it. And again, first time Holly's ever been in, in a movie in a live action adaptation. So obviously they wanted to promote that, but I thought way too much Holly in the first show for the film. And way too much Holly in the actual film. Especially when they're trying to set up this kind of weird rapport between her and Deadshot, who again, like I said before, was basically like the elevated villain protagonist of the film, probably because he was played by Will Smith. Eh. Much as I love Holly, like, you know, let someone else talk for once. Both of you, really. Deadshot had the more Deadshot had more lines, I think, but still, like, way too much focus given to the two of them. I mean, basically at that point you might as well just made it a, a fucking buddy film between the two of them. Which, as interesting as that may sound, I don't think is would have been as good as a as like a buddy flick between, you know, Holly and Poison Ivy. If Holly ever gets her own solo film, they should do that. First, a Holly solo film, and then like a sequel to that should be Holly and Poison Ivy. That would be fucking great to see because they are, they Holly and Poison Ivy have been in like an on again off again relationship in the comics and in, in the the DCAU. Uh, would be cool to see, I think, and probably a better interpretation of of Ivy than what we've seen in Batman uh, Forever. What's Batman and Robin? No, Batman Forever was Batman Forever. Shh. No, it was Batman and Robin. That was one with, with, with Mr. Freeze as well. I would love to see a new version of Mr. Freeze while I'm at it, too. Fuck. Damn it. Dad. I don't know if it's DC or Warner Brothers. Someone's fucking up these movies. Seeing a, a new, better version of Mr. Freeze would be very, very nice. God damn it. I'm off topic right now. Um, I was, I was, I was my place, honestly. Well, anyway, 
That's right. So, bad early reviews for the movie. Uh, weirdest thing, there was, a, there was a petition going around on change.org, I think it was, to have Metacritic shut down, or could be Rotten Tomatoes shut down, one of them, because of the early reviews of the movie. Early critic reviews were being were largely negative. And that isn't the most asinine thing I've ever heard of. Well, one of the most asinine things. I do note, I think, I think, it, was, I think it was Metacritic. Uh, as much as people don't like Metacritic, it's a new, it's, it's a review aggregate. They take all the reviews they can and average them out to give people an idea of what everyone as a whole thought. They didn't review the movie exactly, you know. So, so you, so you, so you, so you, so you, you can't, you, you can't blame them. Again, this is not the first time that critics and fans have disagreed on something. Critics and fans have disagreed on movies all the time, and it hasn't stopped them from being great. Although I will admit, sometimes maybe stopped them from doing very well. Maybe because people saw reviews and thought, you know what, this movie isn't very good, I'm not going to see it. But regardless, critics' reviews have never stopped the movie from being actually good or even bad, depending on your opinion. So that was fucking crazy. That that petition. Petitions, petitions never work. I don't know if people haven't figured it out by now. Petitions never work, especially on, like, online petitions or something. That never fucking works. Uh... I say something. Oh. Okay, say something real, real quick. Jared Leto's and Margaret Roberts' performances as the Joker and Holly Quinn, respectively, were widely praised as a standout, with many critics eager to see more of the characters in future films. Paul Dini, the creator of Holly Quinn, I was just right there. I was going to say that. Said that Robbie nailed the character. And I agree. She did a, a fantastic job. I mean, she she did a just. She was as Harley as you could be. And like I said before, it, she, that was great. But it just the the contention the contention I have is that they didn't flesh out her past with Joker enough, and tried to make her seem like you know a hundred percent insane with that line oh, about the voices in her head voices for, of course for like the sixth time in this video also when when she first met Amanda Waller just uh just though when she asked her are you the devil like trying to make Holly seem like she's so insane she's so insightful that she can very clearly see that Amanda Waller is just pure evil from the, from the jump although to Waller's credit she kind of said eh I might be well, she just very well maybe. I mean, in the movie, she shot like five or six officers because they knew confidential information about, about the Suicide Squad and everything that was going on. So, yeah, maybe she is. She is. She's an evil bastard. I mean, yeah. Oh, I didn't give them a 5.9 out of 10. Saying Suicide Squad is a decidedly different flavor than Batman vs Superman, it goes for subversive, funny, and stylish, and it succeeds wildly during the first act. But then the movie turns into something predictable and ex and exciting. Yeah, that's kind of it. That that's it. It just became what we, what we kind of expect from a comic book movie instead of some, some like the, the very funny, tongue in cheek nature of the beginning beginning of the film, the first act. Acts two and three just kind of just go the the tradition the traditional superhero route, and that would disappoint me. Not to say that it was bad in the way they did it, it wasn't. Just could have done better, or maybe not even done it all. I mean, overall, I don't think the movie was bad. I like the movie. I want to see it again, honestly. The movie the movie wasn't bad, but they could have. Done it one two things better. Again, give more focus to everyone, not just Deadshot and Harley for the movie. But overall, I think the movie was fine. They are going to do a sequel to this movie, uh, and I'm hoping that when they do, either bring in 
they're probably gonna bring in new characters, honestly. Probably maybe even some more um, characters that aren't too well known to, to the mainstream audiences. And people who do come back, I hope they flesh them out a lot better than what than how they did in this first movie. And maybe go into Joker and Hall's past a lot better than they did. Because I, I, I'm already seeing the the uninitiated people for this. I'm already already seeing people online trying to romanticize the, the relationship between Harley and Joker because the movie didn't show enough. And you know, it's just gonna be so much. It's gonna it's gonna be so much fun for me when people point out that the relationship isn't healthy. That Joker will constantly abuse Harley physically and emotionally and mentally. Matter of fact, in the Killing Joke, I believe not not Killing Joke. Um, Death of the Family, Joker actually wanted Harley to carve her face off to look like his, like he had done at the time. Had his face, on purpose, had his face, had his face sliced off, and then reattached it using a belt. You see the skin is very much dead and looks very eerie against his, the rest of his, his alive white um, skin. And he kind of threatened Harley because he wanted her to do the same for his whole plot to kill off the the, the Bat family, except for Batman. And it was it was a ruse in the end. He was he was fucking with her, but still, she was terrified to her bones that Joker was basically forcing her to actually cut her face off. And that's the kind of stuff that he does. As a, as a matter of fact, when he first showed up again to greet to greet Harley in the cemetery, she 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 and someone else had gone to a funeral for someone. I don't remember who exactly. But as soon as he showed back up, one of the first things he did was to punch Harley in the face and knock her to the ground. Like, she was all so excited to see him again. He was feigning happiness himself. Oh, Harley, I haven't seen you in such a long time. Hold on for a second, Harley. There's, there's something on your face there. There's something, there's something big on your face. Then he punches her, knocks her to the ground, and goes, Oh, it was just hubris. It's gone now. Fuck, as, as much as it, as much as I like the Joker, just him and Hall together she just should just not be. And like I said, I'm people who are uninitiated who sing Hall for the first time become super big Holly Quinn fans because of the movie. And again, romanticizing their relationship. That's gonna come fucking come crashing down, especially if the if the sequel does bring Holly back. Talk Holly and Joker and goes it goes more inside their relationship. You're just gonna just see that whole romanticization, romanticization, romanticizing, romantic. You know what I mean? Of them, it's just gonna go out the window entirely, and I'd be interested to see. I'd be interested to see what some people are gonna say about that. How they're gonna try and twist it around? Like, well, that that wasn't how the, the relationship was before in the first movie. Why why did they change it? They ain't change anything, honestly. That's how the relationship has always been. Harley with undying um, respect and adoration for Joker, and Joker just walking all over her like he always has. So, yeah, it was a good movie. Don't listen to the critics, but do take the movie with a grain of salt in both ways, honestly, with fans and critics. I don't think the movie is as bad as critics try to say, but the movie also isn't as spectacular as fans try to say it is. So we take it with a grain of salt. I do recommend seeing it, don't get me wrong. It was a good movie. Not great as it might have should have been. And looking I'm very much looking forward to Wonder Woman after this and Justice League after this. The Wonder Woman trailer looks actually really good to me. Justice League, however, did not look very good to me. Ugh. God, that looks, Justice League looks so forced to me. I'm hoping it does well. But without Superman in it, I don't see how things going to turn out too well. Why did they kill Superman so quickly? That should have been like the last movie of the, the DCEU, the DC Extended Universe. So fucking stupid. Hmm. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, I've talked long enough. Tell me what you think in the comment section. I don't know. Did you like the Did you, did you like the movie? Did you not like the movie? What do you kind of expect? And until next time, who knows when the hell that's going to be. I'll talk to you guys later.